Welcome back to Rick Scale Model Fix and part 2 of Airfix 172nd Scale Jet Provost T3 video build. At the end of part 1 we'd got the model assembled and we'd started to look at some of the remedial work needed to bring the joints where we'd glued the parts together up to scratch and in preparation for painting. We'd use two types of filler, we'd use the guns, Mr Hobby, Mr Surfacer for the small gaps found at the wing root and the tailplane and we'd used our own concoction of sprue glue on the underneath. So I've started on the underneath and I've sanded down that glue and you can just see in that area there probably the little darker shade section which is the glue that's filled the hole and it's set and we've polished that off. Unfortunately with sanding you always seem to destroy surface detail, part of the process unfortunately. If there was a lot of detail found in the area you can mask the area off and just work in the middle. But with this one there was only two panel lines and they just needed reinstating. So my favourite scriber is an RB Productions scribing tool. It's etched metal, folds up and it's inserted into a Swan Morton handle. It's got quite a nice point and this is the benefit of having deeper panel lines such as is found on Airfix kits is that you can just put the scriber in the panel line and just gently re-establish that in the plastic with just gentle pressure. It's a lot better to just do several gentle passes than it is one hard one. So just let the scriber guide you and that's that panel line reinstated. Where we'd lost the panel line altogether under this, this area that we needed to work on a little bit more we can use a template or a guide in which case this is the old fashioned Dymo tape which was used for those labelling machines. Just cut a section put it to where the missing panel is and then simply use that as a guide as I did to reinstate the panel line here. So let's have a look at how I did the, the work there. So we've got this bead of glue that we need to sand down. And we've got no panel lines in the immediate area. So we started off with quite a coarse sanding stick. And again this is Flory Models Dual Sander Skinny of the medium one just to take off the height and the majority of the material that we don't need. So just very gentle pressure, letting the tool do the work. We don't want to cause any further damage by digging in and scratching the plastic. So that's the sanding actually done and the rest of the work is now to repair the damage that we've done. So we can use the sponge section which is a lighter or a finer grade than the black side and that just sort of removes the scratches from that process. And then using the green weathering polishing sanders from the same range we can just buff this plastic back, turn it over and give it a final polish. So again the black line is just the paint that's mixed with the glue from where we sprayed the interior of the fuselage before we joined it together. So the Mr. Surfacer can be removed in a different way. So I'll just grab a little dish. So this is IPA. Cotton bud. I'll dip that in the IPA. And we're just going to rub it over the Mr. Surfacer that we want to remove 
clean up that joint. You've got no risk of removing any surrounding detail. And the Mr. Surfacer will be left in the defect or the gap and hopefully merge it with the, uh, the rest of the panel lines or detail that you want to preserve. Hopefully the camera can pick that up. So just off camera I've been in the spray bay and I've given this a quick application of primer. So for this I've used AK Primer and Micro Filler in grey. Sprays really well but the question has to be asked is why do we need to prime our models? So in the first instance it's a good way of checking that the work you've done in construction is up to standard and that there's no dodgy seams or fingerprints in any glue or anything like that on the model surface. Your application of your top colour paints will only be as good as the surface they're applied to. So if you've got blobs of glue and dodgy seam lines then they will show through and probably be even magnified somewhat. The primer also provides a key for the top colours of paint, particularly important probably using acrylics whereas lacquers with being a solvent based product would probably etch themselves into the surface of the plastic anyway. And also if you've used different colours of filler during assembly then it gives a nice consistent surface for the top coats of colour so that you don't avoid any sort of tone changes as it goes over perhaps a dark green filler if you've used something like squadron green stuff. So I've carried out some work, further corrective work on this joint along the top of the fuselage. We've done the nose, that's nice and tidy now. Everything's looking good, we just need to apply a little bit more primer as a final check. And it's at this point you're going to get the inevitable health and safety warning. So please bear in mind with some of the stuff that we use in the hobby is quite toxic and harmful. Certainly the lacquer base paints contain chemicals and particles that are not going to do your lungs any good. And even the non-toxic range of acrylic paints, breathing the paint particles in would still cause you problems in your lungs. So to that end I recommend that you use a spray booth, however big or small you can afford, one's better than nothing. Spray in a well ventilated room and use a proper respirator stress, you know, face mask. So I'm going to do this, join me back at the cutting mat and we'll have a look at some of the colour schemes that we're going to put on the model. So just turning away from the actual model itself uh, for a while, while that primer dries. Just going to look at some of the markings that I'm going to use on my kit. So to that end I've bought Extra Decal X72250 from Hammonds and this covers a number of airframes. T3s, T4s, T51s and T52s. So whilst there's nothing actually wrong with the kit markings and indeed they are printed by Cartograph and they do build up to look quite nice. I've done one in the light aircraft grey with the day glow scheme and that looked really nice when it was finished. But this just gives us a bit more choice of uh, perhaps some more of the weird and wonderful ones as well as some of the other schemes it carried in RAF service. So we've got a Jet Provost of the 1960s based in RAF Cranwell and that's in silver with fluorescent orange and a blue stripe. Then we've got Cylon Air Force or Sri Lankan Air Force based in Sri Lanka 1971. Again some more colourful markings. And then one of the options I'm considering which is uh, T4 79 Squadron in camouflage, so quite typical of the time, 1984 there at RAF Brodie. So that's in grey, green, over light aircraft grey. South Arabian Air Force based in Iraq, 65. Again, dark earth, dark green, over light aircraft grey. Another quite attractive scheme. Another one that I'm considering is again the same aircraft as the other one depicted in XR679 but this time in a later grey scheme with yellow trim and I must admit I'm airing more to this one. I have got a number of kits and I do plan on doing both so it doesn't really matter which one I do at this point. 
turning the page we've got another couple of options so we've got the McCaws display team 1968 in light aircraft grey and red Venezuelan Air Force example and then a variation on the kit skit one of the kit markings in the day glow and light aircraft grey the only problem I really have with the extra decal sheets is the painting profiles are so small it's sometimes a bit hard to decipher what's what usually if you can blow them up a little bit on the home photocopier it makes it a little bit easier the decal sheet itself is well printed uh, by micros Microscale I believe and everything bar any stenciled data you need for all those airframes is included on the sheet it'd be interesting to see having had a nightmare applying these dayglow flashes out of the kit scheme to see if they've actually fared any better so having decided to go with the grey option, so it's medium sea grey over barley grey with this uh, yellow trim, I've decided that uh, the AK Interactive Primer was perhaps a touch dark and perhaps a bit too much like the medium sea grey. So to help with checking that I'm applying the top colours in a consistent manner, I've elected to just give the model a quick blast with MRP fine surface primer which is a little bit lighter and that's now sat there drying ready for us to begin the painting. So it's always worth taking a step back and just thinking about the colour scheme that you're doing and which is going to be the best approach to applying those colours. So historically and traditionally Modelers tend to work from the lightest colour to the darkest colour, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you can do it in any other way. So if you want to spray a darker colour first, it's just going to take more paint to cover up with a lighter coat of paint afterwards. Looking at the one that we're doing, it's going to be interesting uh, to decide on whether we paint all the grey, mask the yellow and spray that, or whether we spray the yellow first and then mask that area off and spray the grey. Either way, yellow is a notoriously tricky colour to apply. So we're going to have to apply a white primer to these areas and I think we're going to spray the yellow first and mask that off and then spray the grey around it. So as we head towards the painting stages with our Jet Provost, thought it might just be a good idea to talk about some of the paints that are available in the modelling market. There's a vast array of paint out there all claiming to be the best of the best and what my advice would be is to find something that uh, you as the modeler are happy with, you like the colours and you can work with and give good results. Don't be swayed by other opinions, try them for yourself first. However, it can be said that the paint falls into probably three distinct categories. So we've got old school enamel, such as Humbrol, and in this case extra colour. And modellers of a certain age will remember that this was probably the only paint available for a number of years. I quite like the extra colour paints, the gloss. Thinned and sprayed correctly, they give a lovely, wonderful gloss finish. Downside is that they can take days, even weeks, to dry fully. The next category uh, can be water-based acrylics. So these are uh, advertised as non-toxic. and uh, They are literally, as they say, water-based. They can be a bit on the delicate side and a bit problematic spraying. Um, certainly with things like tip drying on the airbrush and stuff like that, but there's ways around that. Next category, and seems to be the newest and latest trend, such as with hair tacker orange line and in some respects MRP, are the lacquer based paints. And hair tacker certainly perform very well. They dry very quickly, which is the downside of the extra colour. And they are solvent based, so they are fairly resilient to handling after once they're completely dry. Next category is what I'm going to call as hybrids. So these are marketed as acrylics. 
they can be thinned with lacquer or sort of water based thinners and they're a bit of a hybrid between the two so you've got guns Mr Hobby Aqueous and good old Tamiya and there's another few ranges that have come out onto the market such as AK real colours as well so many ask probably what's my preferred brand well all of them uh, some of the colours are not available in each other's paint ranges however those paint ranges are vast in some instances the likes of Hataka Tammy is a bit limited but they all have the place and they all find a, a way onto the workbench and ultimately through the airbrush so let's turn our thoughts towards painting our JP so a slight technical hitch in the plans for this video we originally intended to do the medium sea grey over barley grey scheme with the yellow flashes however when I've gone to the paint stash I haven't got a suitable yellow so to save some time like I said I was going to build both the examples of this airframe anyway so we've decided to go with the camo version which is RF dark sea grey dark green over light aircraft grey we're going to use Hitaka orange line for these so we've got C217 for the light aircraft grey can't read that one for the dark green and C144 for the dark sea grey so starting with the lightest colour first we're going to apply the light aircraft grey so we're going to give this a good shake, wake it up I also prise the top of the bottle off and get in there with a Tamiya paint stirrer just to get all the sediment up from the bottom and it needs a really good shake to activate this paint and get it all mixed up it's quite thick so we're going to thin it probably 70% thinners to 30% paint so I shall mix that up into the airbrush colour cup so it's only a small model no precise mixes here it's just doing it till it looks right it's a piece of kitchen roll check the spray that looks okay so we'll make a start so join me back in a bit when I finish the underside and we'll have a look at the results so it was my original intention to video the painting process but after a couple of failed attempts, with it being 70 seconds scale and quite small, it was really difficult to get in with the camera and show you what I was doing. Plus it took the best part of three hours to uh, paint the model. So as you can see from the end result, it looks quite neat and tidy. We used the Hitaka orange line throughout and we thinned those to a 70% thinners paint ratio with Mr. Leveling Thinners and then just to finish off and protect the paintwork we've given it a coat of GX Super Clear Gloss and we've just got some of the smaller detail painting to do now such as the combing, the bulkhead just to bring that up to speed we've got a bit of overspray on there and a metallic part around the jet exhaust Masking curves is sometimes a bit of a pain, certainly in the smaller scales. So we use some of Tamiya's very fine tape for curves and we've just traced the outline of the combing. We've come along past the sills and we're just going to mask this bit with some traditional tape. We're just going to mask off around the area and then we're going to spray the combing and the back of the rear bulkhead with some black. Just making sure that we cover 
all the perimeter of the fuselage. We don't want any black overspray on the fresh paintwork. That's masked and we're just going to spray these areas in now with some black. Just protect the, uh, the spine a little bit more there. So we can leave our we can leave our foam in there. We don't want any overspray going onto that at our etched panel. And we're just checking the edges, that's fine. And there we go. So we're using Mr. Color H77 tire black. We've got airbrush color cut, and we're just gonna spray in this combing. Always spraying away and over the opening. So we're just making sure that foam is protecting the area just to catch the edge of the combing. And then we're down on the canopy sills and that rear bulkhead. So with this paint now done, the painted area is now completed, we can just set about removing the masking tape. And such. Just being careful with the blades of the tweezers there not to uh, scratch the paintwork. And there we have our neat instrument combing and bulkhead ready for the addition of the cockpit clear parts. So we're now going to look at adding the clear parts. So working with clear parts needs a little bit more care. But nonetheless we can treat them just like the plastic equivalents. So with our JP we've got uh, three separate sections. So we have the front windscreen section. And these are really, really tiny, so I'll do my best to pick them up on camera for you. A rear section and a sliding centre section. The parts are all wonderfully clear, and the good thing about these kits is the panel lines in the framework is really pronounced, which makes it easy to mask without using mask sets. So we're going to take a look at that. So first of all, attaching the clear parts, I've cleaned these up just like I would any other plastic part, being careful not to stress the part in any way because with some kits it could actually break. So we're going to add these using, in the first instance, micro crystal clear, but you can use your normal sort of Tamiya quick set. So with just this rear section being quite small, we're going to uh, we're going to mask this on the model. So we're just going to clean it just to make sure there's no fingerprints on the inside. We're going to get some crystal clear, just on a cocktail stick, and we're just going to add that around the framework. Now the thing with crystal clear is it does exactly what it says. It dries crystal clear, which means when we're using it for the clear parts you won't see it if there's any excess glue under the 
clear part. So we're just going to drop this in place. A little bit too much for my liking there though. So using a wet cotton bud, I'm just going to remove this. From the inside. And I'm just going to remove the splodgy, splodgy glue there. And we're just going to try again. Half of the part up. Drop it in place. And the good thing with the crystal clear is if you wipe it away it will actually fill any little gaps between the model and the clear part. Just making sure everything's square and we're going to leave that now to dry. Hopefully the camera can pick that up for you as you appreciate the model is 70 second scale and it is really quite small. So when it comes to masking canopy framework you can either buy a commercial canopy mask set or if the framework's really quite pronounced like on this kit you can do it yourself. So all we need is in this instance Tamiya masking tape. And we're going to work from a straight edge. So we've got a straight edge down the centre of the canopy. And we're just going to mask to that straight edge. We're just going to gently work this tape around the cockpit. And as you can probably already see, the framework is, point, is uh, visible. So we're just going to use a cocktail stick just to burnish the edges. And then I'm going to use a pencil, a self propelling pencil. I've cut a wedge shape into the pencil lead so that I get a sharp line as I'm tracing round. And then it's a case of cutting round the pencil line with your knife. So I always, without fail, put a brand new knife blade onto the handle when I'm dealing with masking canopies. And what we're going to do now is we're going to trace round the framework. So it's always better to start in a corner and we're just resting the knife blade against the framework and a very very light pressure just enough to go through the masking tape sees that come away so we're just going to start the very light pressure brand new blade doesn't need much encouragement to go through the masking tape like so can carefully remove the mask. Just looking for any edges we have missed, which is one there, and we can just remove that. And then it's a case of repeating this on the other side. Hopefully the camera can pick that up, because it's really quite small. So we're going to repeat this for the other side. And 
and once you're practiced at this you can uh, rattle the canopy off in a matter of minutes sometimes depending on how many uh, frames it's got or how many parts it's got some of the World War II stuff with a big greenhouse would uh, take you a while but again as long as the canopy framework is reasonably defined this system will work quite well Just making sure that there's no rough edges and that everything is as it should be and now we have the sliding section of our JP masked so with the canopies masked and painted all it leaves me to do now is to complete the undercarriage of the model and to add that to the kit itself. So that concludes part two. So please join me in part three when we look at getting the model finished. So until then, everyone please look after yourselves, stay well and take care.